Good morning, Emmanuel Baptist Church. We're so glad that you could join us this morning. Sorry, we're a little delayed. We're having tech issues, but we're so glad that you're joining us on this Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Um, we know this is a time of celebration of mothers, but also it can be a difficult time for those who have a mother's passed on or are praying to be a mother one day. But we know they're all different kinds of mothers, spiritual mothers, and so we just celebrate all the mothers today. And if we're ready, we're going to worship with you this morning. Proverbs 31, 25. Strength and dignity are her clothing. She laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. Streams of mercy never 
for this day. We thank you for this time to worship you, Lord, to come together near and far and praise your name, Lord Jesus. We just pray for Pastor Andrew as he comes and brings your word today, that it would touch our hearts and move us closer to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for leading us this morning in worship. We look forward to um, uh, that a bit later as well. Uh, I would go on record this morning to say that I, I hate reality TV. Um, I don't find it that realistic, actually. But, but I would watch this. Let me pitch this for you. Six men will be dropped off on an island. And they will get one van and four kids for six weeks. Uh, each of their kids plays a sport, takes music or dance lessons, and there's no access to fast food. Each man must take care of his four kids, keep his assigned house clean, correct all homework, complete science projects, cook, do laundry. The men will have access to television, when the kids are asleep and all chores are done, but there's no remote control because the kids will take turns hiding it at the end of the day. They must be able to get a four-year-old to eat green beans. The men must shave their legs and wear makeup daily, which they must apply themselves while driving or making lunches. They will be judged on how well they can make an indigenous Canadian teepee with six toothpicks and a tortilla. The winner gets voted off the island and gets his old job back. Today is Mother's Day. And so I want to talk about mothers. I want to honor our mothers. Now, my experience uh, giving birth to a living being is somewhat limited. And my perspective is somewhat narrowed and flawed at times. I was telling someone this week that this is perhaps one of the more difficult weeks of the year to preach. Uh, because I am not a mother. Um, I was an associate pastor for uh, some description for some 10 years before becoming a senior pastor, and I, I would have to look it up, but I believe I preached um, eight of those 10 Mother's Days um, since I was a pastor. It, it was like, Andrew, I want to give you a morning service, and so you're thinking, okay, that's great. Uh, yeah, it's Mother's Day. And so, trying to be positive, I attributed it to the fact that um, it was because I knew so much about being a mother. But my experience is that either uh, mothers love what you have to say, and the men are like, buddy, what are you doing to us? Or uh, maybe the mothers are leaving feeling guilty. And so my goal today is not uh, to make you feel guilty. Um, I'm obviously not a mother. I have a mother whom I, I will call later. Uh, I live with my wife, the mother of my four children, and I've gotten to know most of you, and some of you are mothers. So bear with me. I don't, don't want to make you feel guilty today. I want to look at the scriptures, and I want to honor you, and I want to challenge all of us this morning. So let's pray together. Let's pray together. Father, uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to gather and Father, recognizing that uh, we are not in control of things, uh, you are. Uh, recognizing that you have a plan and a purpose for us. And so Father, this morning as, as we gather, as, we, um, as uh, some of us are, are here in this building, some of us will, will watch this online. Father, take this time together of worship, take this time together of, of opening your word together and challenge us, encourage us, teach us, grow us as we seek to honor you in these moments. And we'll be careful to give you praise in these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, you've heard it said that there are consequences to decisions. And now technically that's true. There are consequences to decisions. Um, but we can recognize that there are different consequences to different decisions. I mean, there's some decisions that are not permanent. Um, there are things that, uh, that you will buy that I will buy. 
And sometimes the decision is, well, I'll see how that works for me. And if it doesn't fit or I don't like how it works or I don't like how it looks on me, uh, not a big deal. I mean, you could buy a, a shirt and, um, and you could take it back. I mean, that's a, a really neat option for somebody who's not a shopper. You can take it home and try it on and you can see how you like it and then you can bring it back. So not, not a huge consequence there. There are decisions that you make that don't have long-range consequences, like you could eat at a restaurant uh, and, and you don't like it, and you don't have to eat there for the rest of your life. You could eat at a different restaurant the next time. There's no long-range implications to that. There are other decisions that even though they have consequences, they are not major consequences. If you bought something that was really cheap and you would say, you know, I'll try it out and and maybe it'll work for me, but maybe it won't work for me. It's only a couple of dollars, and so I'll try it. If I don't like it, it doesn't last very long. Not that big of a deal. There are some consequences, but nothing really major. But then there are decisions that we can make that have serious consequences. Maybe it's your education. Maybe it's um, your career choice. Maybe it's your marriage where you make the vows till death do us part. Or maybe it's having children where you have many, many years invested in the lives of those children that will grow into adults and you continue to invest in their lives. I, I want to direct you this morning on this Mother's Day to the book of Ruth, a small little book, maybe a fifth of the way through the Bible. Ruth makes decisions that have long-range implications and because she's made a wise decision, because she has made a selfless decision, the name is going to be called Ruth, not the book of Orpah, not the book of Naomi, not the book of even Boaz, but the book of Ruth, because she made a life-changing decision. Now, maybe you're familiar with the book of Ruth. It's a story that uh, Elimelech and Naomi, um, dad and mom, they find themselves in a difficult situation. And according to Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, the story took place during the time of the judges, uh, 400 year period after Israel enters the promised land. Joshua and um, before there were any kings, uh, Joshua um, um, enters the promised land in roughly 1500 BC to 1100 BC. The book of Judges comes just before the book of Ruth in our English Bibles and you can see from its very last verse what sort of a period it was. Judges chapter 21 verse 25 says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. A very dark time in Israel. Uh, the people would sin, God would send enemies against them, people would cry for help, and then God would mercifully raise up this judge who would rally the people, would lead the people, and would rescue them, deliver them from this, this issue. Again and again, the people rebelled, and from outward appearances, God's righteousness and glory in Israel is failing. And what the book of Ruth does for us is it gives us a glimpse of the hidden work of God during the worst of times. If you look at the last verse of Ruth, chapter 4, verse 22, you would see that the child born to Ruth and Boaz during the period of the judges is Obed. And Obed becomes the father of Jesse, and Jesse becomes the father of David, who would lead Israel as a king to, to great heights, to great glory. And so one of the main messages of this book is that God is at work even in the worst of times. And I asked this morning, do you believe that? Even through the sins of his people, he doesn't plot, yeah, he, he doesn't plot them uh, for enemies. He doesn't plot them for ill. He plots them for prospering. He plots them for, for glory. It's true at the national level. And we're going to see this morning that it's true at the personal level. It's true at the family level as well. And so God is at work in the worst of times. When you think he's the farthest from you or has even turned against you, the truth is, the truth is that he's laying the stones of the foundation to build on things in your life. So let's look at the book of Ruth together. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Mahon and Chilon. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. 
they went into the country of Moab and remained there, but Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. They, these took Moabite wives. The names of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, and, when, and both Malon and Chilion died, so that the woman was left there with her two sons and her husband, without her two sons and her husband. So we start off this book, and we're looking at Naomi's life and quickly realize that we see the death of her husband, we see the marriage of her two sons to foreign wives, and then we see the death of her two sons. So there's blow after blow, tragedy after tragedy, two weddings and three funerals and three widows. And so now what? In verse 6, Naomi gets word that the Lord has visited his people and given them food back in her homeland. So she decides to, to return to Judah, and her two daughter-in-laws, Ruth and Orpah, go with her at least part way, it seems. And then in verses 8 to 13, she tries to persuade them to return home. Look at verse 8. But Naomi says to her two daughter-in-laws, go return each of you to her mother's house, May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and lifted up their voices and wept, and they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way. For I too am, for I am too old to have a husband." If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband that this night should bear me sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for is it exceedingly bitter for me, for your sake, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. I think there's three reasons why the writer devotes so much time and space and, and uh, effort to Naomi's effort here to turn Ruth and, and Orpha back to their homeland. First, the scene seems to put some emphasis on Naomi's misery. For example, verse 11, Naomi says, Turn back, my daughters, will you go with me? I, have I yet sons in my womb? Will they become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. In other words, Naomi has nothing to offer them. Her condition is worse than theirs. It's no advantage to Orpha or to Ruth to stick around for the sake of their mother-in-law. If they tried to be faithful to her and in, in the name of their husbands, they will find nothing but pain. So she concludes at the end of verse 13, no, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter for me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. Don't come with me because if you come with me, your life is gonna end up just like mine and you will end up being bitter just like I am bitter. The second reason for verses 8 to 13 is to prepare us for a custom that is in Israel that's going to turn everything around for Naomi in the following chapters. The custom was that when an Israelite husband died, his brother or near relative was to marry the widow and to continue the name, to continue the, the brother's name there. And so Naomi is referring to this custom in verse 11 when she says she has no sons uh, to marry for Ruth and Orpah. Um, she thinks it's hopeless for Ruth and Orpah to remain committed to the family name. So she doesn't remember evidently that there is a, another relative whose name is Boaz, who we are introduced to later in the book, who might perform the duty of, of a brother. There's a lesson here. When we've decided that God is against us. We usually exaggerate our, our hopelessness. I think that's a, it's a thing that's in us. It's sort of ingrained in us. That when we feel like God's against us, we exaggerate our hopelessness. We become so bitter that we can't even see the, the rays of light that are kind of coming through the clouds or peeking around the clouds. It was God who broke the famine and opened the way home. It, it was God who preserved a kinsman to continue Naomi's line. And it was God who constrains Ruth to stay with Naomi, but Naomi is so embittered and she is so upset with God 
at his providence that she can't see his mercy at work in her life. And so there's a reminder to us here that God is at work even when we don't see it. The third reason for verses 8 to 13 is to show that Ruth's faithfulness to Naomi is amazing. Verse 14 says that Orpah kissed Naomi goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Not even another plea in verse 15 can get Ruth to leave. This is all the more amazing as Naomi's grim description kind of unfolds of what her future is going to look like. You stay with me. This is what your life is going to be like. So she stays with her in spite of an apparent hopelessness um, of widowhood and childlessness for her. But Naomi paints the picture as black and and, and bleak and, and, and negative, and, and um, Ruth takes her, her hand and, and walks with her in this. The amazing words of Ruth are found in verses 16 to 17. Let's look at those. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. The more you ponder these words, the more amazing they become. Ruth's incredible commitment to her mother-in-law here is, is amazing and, and evident. First, it means leaving her own family and, and her own land. Second, it means as far as she knows that she will pursue a, a, a life of being a widow and being childless because Naomi has no man to give. And if she married a non-relative, her commitment to Naomi's family would be lost. Third, it means going to an unknown land, to an unknown people, and to embrace new customs, to embrace a new language, Fourth, it's a commitment even more radical than marriage here because she says, where you die, I will die, and there I will be married. So in other words, um, she's never going to go home. She's never going to return home, even if um, Naomi dies. But the most amazing commitment to this is she says, your God will be my God. Naomi has just said in verse 13, the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. Naomi's experience of God was bitterness, but in spite of this, Ruth forsakes her religious heritage and makes the God of Israel her God. Perhaps she made that commitment years before when her husband told her about the great God of Israel and the love that he has for his people and the miracles that he'd performed historically. Somehow or other, Ruth has come to trust Naomi's God in spite of the bitterness, in spite of the things that Naomi is saying and feeling right now, Ruth is committed to the God of Naomi, to the God of Israel. And she says, I'm staying. Naomi sees that she's determined Ruth's decision, commitment springs from a, a selflessness, from a refusal to listen to the arguments that would say, what's in it for me? What is the heart of our sin nature? What is the essence of our sin nature? It's selfishness. That's the essence. That's what destroys everything. And you see, Ruth is willing to fight that self-interest for the favor of another. Do you realize this morning that the opposite of love is not hate? I mean, there's people that you do not hate, but it doesn't necessarily mean you, you love them. In fact, there are people that say, I, I love everybody. Maybe that's because they haven't met everybody. But the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is selfishness. I, I mean, that's, that's really the crux. That's the essence of our old sin nature. And selfishness kills everything it touches. In this case, it has the potential to kill her relationship with her mother-in-law, but that essence of selfishness kills what it touches. It's against what 
what God is. It's against the very nature of God if we are selfish. This book is sandwiched in the scriptures right at the end of the book of Judges. I said that already. Everyone did what was right in his or her own eyes. I mean, what is that? It's selfishness. And in Ruth, God shows us, God gives us this glimpse, this, this picture of people, really both Ruth and, and her future husband, Boaz, who, who break this mold of selfishness, who break this mold of doing what is right in your own eyes. Who, who say, you know what, that may be the way of the world, that may be the way that everybody else lives, but that's not how I'm going to live. It's of every advantage in the eyes of the world to walk away and to do what is right for me, but I'm going to put aside these advantages, uh, these advantages for me and for others. I'm going, to, I'm, I'm, going to put, I'm going to think of others instead of myself. Ruth is young and um, not known here yet, but is going to be a young mother and she's going to fight selfishness because selfishness causes relationships to crash and to burn. I've seen it dozens of times. Where, where there is um, an issue with a, a couple in a relationship and, and they're not getting along and then when you, when you dig a little bit deeper and you don't even have to dig that deep, you recognize that so much of it is rooted in selfishness. You know, some of you, um, you didn't jump on here wanting to hear that today, but you need to, and I need to. We all need to hear that. It's almost impossible to keep a relationship going when both individuals are selfish. Ruth refused the arguments of self-interest. She wouldn't listen or respond or allow um, Naomi to persuade her because it is selflessness, selflessness, that establishes and rebuilds and revives and, and makes relationships. If you're going to have a healthy relationship with anyone, it's going to have to be because someone will die to self. In a relationship, if someone is not going to die to self, that relationship will crash and burn. I mean, humanly speaking, Naomi was exactly right in her arguments, wasn't she? With, with Orpah and with Ruth, um, they had nothing to gain and they had everything to lose. And, and Orpah is a good person. Don't get me wrong here. Orpah is a good person, but she understood the truth of the argument and she wasn't willing to live with it. And, and Ruth understood the truth in the argument as well, but refused to accept it because it was human wisdom. It was the way of the world, but she knew that in God's economy, there's no such thing as, as an empty shelf. How do we do that? How do we operate like Ruth? I could say this morning that we need to be less selfish, and I think we could all say amen to that. We might say, I'm not a selfish person, and no one wants to admit that they are selfish themselves, Maybe they don't even know. I mean, selfish compared to who? Selfish compared to what? We don't want to say that we're selfish, but we could say that we need to be more selfless, right? How do you do that? How do you operate like Ruth? How do you get to where Ruth is? Would an example of a daughter-in-law to her mother-in-law or a daughter to her mother or a brother or sister to another brother or sister? I mean, how do, we, how do we get there? Let me tell you, it's given partly in chapter 1, verse 16. Ruth says, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Where your people shall be my people and your God, my, my God. No doubt that Ruth in the past has seen Naomi's faith. She knows the impact of her God. She knows the impact of her faith on her life. She has learned from her. She's been mentored by her. She respects her. She um, knows Naomi's God. But now Naomi is bitter because of a world of hurt reacting to the circumstances that, uh, unbelievably difficult circumstances that she's faced in her life and she's hurting and she's probably saying things that may be very real to her at the time 
and her heart is breaking even though her head still knows that God is with her. But Naomi is bitter. And Orpha has every right to do what she does, but um, she is looking out for herself. She is looking out for her future. Ruth is a believer in Naomi's God, and I believe genuinely wants to help Naomi get back to the place where her faith is impacting her life, where her faith is strong and this bitterness is put away. In chapter 2, we're introduced to Boaz. Boaz, who we find out has heard about her, heard about Ruth, heard about her reputation. The reputation of Ruth has preceded her. And so in chapter 2, verse 12, we come across the phrase, the God of Israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge. To use that term, under his wings, is essentially to describe a believer in God. So Ruth is a believer in God. Ruth lived her life to say, I can trust God. She lived her life to say, I don't need to be selfish here because God is in control. Do you believe that this morning? Total selflessness on the part of Ruth. Naomi is is correct. Naomi, Naomi is right in her assessment here. This is a bad move for you girls. There's nothing here for you. You will gain nothing by following me, by going with me, by being with me. You will gain nothing by this. You will lose in the end, and from a a human perspective, it's bang on, and Orpah knew it. Ruth knew it. But Ruth responds by saying, you know what, You're, you're right, but ultimately, it's not about me. Ultimately, it's not about what I would gain. It's about my relationship with you, and I'm committed to it. It's about my love for you, and I'm committed to it, and I believe that in the end, it's not me that writes the final chapter. God does. And if you read through the book of Ruth, you know that the final chapter is a thing of beauty. She, she knows that without faith, it's impossible to please God. You must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who earnestly, who diligently seek him, to those who pursue him. And she knew that um, God is with them. She knew God was going to take care of them. And she doesn't have to act selfishly that, you know, if God doesn't come through, at least I have myself covered. I mean, she is committed 100% to God, knowing that he writes the final chapter. I've said already this is taking place in the time of the judges, and what's so unique about this? Read the last two verses of, of Judges again with me, where it says this, Judges 21, 24. The people of Israel departed from there, and at that time every man to his tribe and his family, and they went out from there, every man to his inheritance. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Do you know what that means? It means that everyone does what is good in their own eyes. I mean, I can't think of a better way really to describe our culture today. Everyone doing what is right in their own eyes. Everyone does what they want to do. Everyone does it their way. Do you think it's deliberate? It, it is, it, I'll tell you, it is deliberate that it's recorded there. Deliberate to record these words in this context because at the end of Ruth, uh, there is a king now in the lineage who has the same heart, acting with no self-interest. We see it in Ruth. We see it in Boaz. It's of no advantage for Boaz to take Ruth as his wife, but Boaz was the same, and he did the same. How do they live like that? It's because they have a trust in God that they know will, in the end, write the final chapter. I don't know about you moms out there, but but I need to hear that today. God writes the final chapter. So how can we trust him? He's already proven to be trustworthy. He's already proven that he loves us this way. You see, when everyone was doing, everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes, he came, he lived, he died, he gave, he rose again. 
And there's no advantage for him in that. No benefit for him, but eternal benefits for us. You want a picture of selflessness? You want someone you can trust? Jesus did it. And Ruth and Boaz are are pretty good examples as well. And I'm reminded today that mothers are selfless. If they're not, they're not great mothers. Selflessness is what builds relationships. Someone is dying to self. I see it in my mom. I see it in my wife. I see it in my sister. I mean, three mothers that I've lived with in my life the longest. They're not perfect, but they're great mothers because they give, because they live the principles of selflessness. Where in so many times in their lives, and you as mothers this morning, and so many times in your life, it has been no advantage to you to act the way that you do, to give the way that you give, but you die to self for the sake of another. And I see it in so many of you, and I want to challenge you this morning. God loves a selfless giver. Those who say it's of no advantage in this for me, but I'm going to give anyway. Christ did not want us for what we have, for we have nothing. We were outside the land. We were in that sense dead. Christ comes along and says, Father, I I know they're nothing. I know they're not part of our family. I know they're outside the camp, but I'm willing to spread my sacrifice over them to redeem them, and I'm not worried about losing everything And we know that Jesus Christ lost everything. He gave up everything. He considered it loss. He didn't worry about losing the the farm up in heaven to come down to save the bride of Christ in the sense and prepare that bride by redeeming her and making her available to come to God's kingdom. He, He never had a second thought about it. It says, in fact, the scriptures tell us, for the joy that was set before him. And it says in Hebrews chapter 2, as he's describing this, he says, you are my family, you are my brothers, you are my sisters. And he has no shame in that. So in Ruth, they get together. Naomi gets happy. And one thing I want to share with you right now, some of you are going through a, a wilderness experience in your life. There are... Some of you that have holes in your life right now, your hearts are broken because of loss. Some of you may be in chapter one, you may be in chapter two, you may be in chapter three, you know when you lose someone like a spouse or, or, or a child, be it through death or be it through a decision. Um, you can never fill that. You can never replace that. You can't, I mean, no words or actions can make that reality disappear. But God says that he will make a way where there seems to be no way. Somehow, some way, he'll provide a compass. It calls us to be people of integrity. If we're people of vision, we come back through the roughs and the valleys and the rocks of life and come to understand that God loves us. He really does. And sometimes we have to remind each other of that. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves of that because it may not seem like that today for you. Maybe all you have is questions. Why me? Why now? Why this? I want to tell you today that he hears that. He knows that. And we know at the end of the book that Naomi has a little baby on her lap and she served as a nurse to a little guy called Obed whose son was Jesse, whose son was David, whose great, 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 28 generations later is none other than Jesus Christ. What do we learn from the book of Ruth? That God 
has a plan and, and he sees so far into the future and, and he, he, he sees the big picture. We not only have a loving God, but we have a God who works out that plan. He took two individuals that you and I would never ever put together, an old, an old widow, a young foreign woman from a land that was, was dark, and he says, you're mine, I claim you. I'm not going to forget about you, and I don't want you to forget about me, I want to use you. And you, you think 1,100 years down the road, 1,100 years down the line, all the qualities of Jesus Christ, integrity and compassion and perseverance and hard work and honor, I wonder where he got that from. I mean, yeah, his heavenly father, because he is the son of God. But genes and learning are passed down from generation to generation, and never underestimate your God, and never underestimate what God wants to do through you as you make yourself available to him and keep yourself available to him. May all you ladies out there on this Mother's Day weekend have the heart of Ruth. May all our men out there have the heart of Boaz as we earnestly seek the heart of God who showed us the ultimate example of selflessness in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this short little book that's sandwiched in the first half of of the Old Testament. That in a time that is bleak and everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes, everyone is acting selfishly, that you show us, show us glimpses of hope, you, you show us a, a glimpse of selflessness. Someone who would say, it's of no advantage to me to do this, to act this way, to make this decision. But I'm going to trust in a God who is. I'm going to trust in a God who's proven himself to be trustworthy in my life. I'm going to trust in a God who maybe even everything around me right now is, is telling me not to. Everything around me right now is saying maybe he's not in control. Maybe he doesn't love me. But Father, we're reminded time and time again in your word and Ruth is able to see that because of the, the help that you give to her, because of the hope that you give to her. That you're not done with us yet. And you write the final chapter. With you, there is never an empty shelf. You have a plan. And you're working it out for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. Father, maybe we need to hear that today. Maybe there's some moms out out there today that need to hear that, to be encouraged uh, that, that we need to continue to to keep our eyes focused on, on, on Christ. To continue to develop and foster the selfless heart that we see in Ruth, that we see in Boaz, that we see in the clearest possible way in Jesus Christ, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. Father, remind us of that this morning. Encourage us with that this morning. And and challenge us that you continue to love us. You continue to have a plan for us. For those who seek you, follow you with their hearts. So Father, um, we thank you that you love us and you bless us and you lavish us with your love and grace and mercy. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen.
What a fitting um, benediction to the service this morning. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Turn his face toward you and give you peace, both now and throughout all generations. Amen and amen. Thanks for joining us this morning.